welcome everyone welcome to the 11th episode of capital analyst uh, today we have two special guests with us our first guest is mr anish tehi anish is the founder and managing partner at qvd capital a boutique pms firm using quantitative and behavioral finance to invest in the markets prior to this she was working as the vice president at icici ventures and executive director at morgan stanley private equity asia where he was managing multi billion dollar fund investing across asia anish is a rank holding chartered accountant and an mba from indian school of business hyderabad our next guest is avijit bansal avijit is an assistant professor in finance and control at iim calcutta he completed his phd from iim ahmedabad last year with his thesis on the disposition effect which won him the professor tirath gupta memorial award for best thesis he has also worked for an year at zs associates in the past he teaches behavioral finance and corporate finance currently at iim calcutta welcome to the show anish and avijit how are you doing Thank you, Prabal. Pleasure to be on your show, and thanks for having me. All right. Uh, so let's kickstart the discussion uh, by posing this question to uh, Anish, sir. So, uh, sir, you started your firm QED Capital in 2011 after your stint at Morgan Stanley Private Equity. So, uh, I, I understand that you have already been interested in investing right from your uh, education days when you were pursuing your chartered accountancy. but what drove you to base yeah. your firm around quantitative and behavioral finance why did you choose this niche uh, to set up your investment fund so actually i did not choose it i think the the style chose me uh, so i like you rightly said you know i've been interested in public markets right so from my uh, pa days so i i'm actually from calcutta so i studied in calcutta and uh, i did my articleship in calcutta and uh, while i was doing my articleship you know whatever little stipend money you used to get uh, there was living at home i had that uh, money and i i uh, used to invest that money uh, in public markets and i think uh, not by design uh, just by uh, you know just by fluke the you know the first two stocks i bought were uh, value Stocks. I did not know that it was a factor or anything. So that's at that point in time. So you know, one stock, the first stock was uh, Stock Authority of India, Steel, Steel Authority of India, and uh, you know it was trading at point two five to book. And um, the other company was uh, Premier Auto, which was supposed to have a big land bank in Kurla, and they were going to unlock that. And you know, so so both were trading under book value. So traditionally, how you start off looking for cheap. Uh, Companies and uh, so one turned out to be a multi-bagger. The other company went bust. So you know that's how my investing journey in the uh, public market started. Uh, then I I worked for a couple of years uh, in corporate finance with a European firm called BDO in in Bombay. Uh, then I went to ILB. I did my uh, MBA from there. And uh, then I worked in private equity at ICICI Venture and Morgan Stanley. But I think my uh, Interest was more always towards in public markets. So in 2011, I moved full time to investing in public markets. And uh, uh, you know, as as I moved uh, into full time investing, I realized that uh, you know, even though I was a full time uh, investor in uh, uh, while I was when I was doing my private equity, uh, investing in public markets is a is a whole different game altogether. It's a different ball game, and. Uh, as i uh, you know in 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 private equity markets you are not really worried about what the market is thinking you are you are sort of uh, buffered from the day to day volatility of market so the behavioral aspect is very very different whereas uh, when you are investing in public markets you know things because you can see prices every day uh, i think no investor can say that prices don't impact them so you know says so that 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 is very different and uh, then uh, for the next couple of years i was sort of finding my i was uh, you know finding good uh, opportunities opportunities to invest i found the janta pharma i found four or five other good companies but as i studied my uh, investment record i it was not uh, you know a chattering so i was doing some 18 19% uh, cagger i said you know it should be my 3 4 years uh, worth of uh, the complete record and uh, at that time uh, you know i was also reading about these market wizards the whole market wizards tv by jack schwager so i was reading about uh, 
to those guys and therein i came across this framework called canclip uh, by william o'neil and uh, so where he talks about identifying a stock and it's it's it, it it adds both technical and fundamental aspects of investing and from there struck something that you know i did not have an exit plan for my losers while the winners did well uh, what struck me was that i you know i, I kept on holding to my losers what uh, you know professor bantler uh, is that is exactly the you know the disposition effect that you sort of tend to sell your winners and yeah and hold on to your losers so what i did was i did the thought experiment i sort of if i uh, cut off my losers at 10% and uh, my 80% whereas if i kept on holding to if i had held on to those losers my returns would have dropped to 12% the next year so that's when i that's when i found that okay you know there is some uh, that, that was a chink in my investing process so i i said okay, let me come up with a checklist and then as i read more and more about canclim and things like that i discovered that you know there was this other world of factor investing where and canclim was nothing but a bunch of factors put together where you had a market factor you had a momentum factor where you had uh, some amount of you know uh, earning earning factor and things like that and as i tried to make my process more and more quantitative as as i went went by and you know that's how i stumbled upon uh, quantitative investing got it got it that's that's quite an interesting journey you have had uh, so my next question is to professor bansal uh, so since uh, you have been studying this field for quite a long time now and uh, you also did your thesis in this and you came up with this course behavioral finance uh, at time calcutta when when was this field actually uh, recognized by academics and when did this concept of behavioral finance came about and people started realizing that this could actually be used as a tool of investing uh, separately so actually like most of the things actually the practitioners knew about this well before the academics so i think in in 1970s and 80s there was this so called wave of efficient market hypothesis that was like sweeping academia and whenever the practitioners wanted to point point things out that okay there is an apparent mispricing there are predictable patterns so the academics had a very simple uh, statement called arbitrage argument and and simply the argument was essentially of okay if there is a mispricing why don't people just swoop in and, and eliminate it so why will and if there is mispricing why will it persist for a prolonged period of time so this field actually started developing with something uh, called limits to arbitrage and that is where the academics actually uh, conclusively pointed out that okay even in presence of so called very very apparent opportunities for making money there may be practical frictions which uh, inhibit the practitioners or anybody who is transacting in the market to take advantage of these opportunities so 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 these so called mispricing can persist for a very very prolonged period of time and one very simple example of this is like in textbooks in first year corporate finance when we talk about the idea of short selling we we treat it as just as a asymmetric transaction of buying decision but practically executing a short selling transaction is a nightmare and if you are aware of episodes like gamestop or volkswagen which happened in 2008 the short sellers are exposed to i would say infinite losses and the risk that a short seller bears is is far greater compared to the risk which a uh, long investor bears so precisely because you cannot execute the second half of the transaction with that degree of uh, i would say comfort uh, you can obviously expect that the mispricing can prevail for a far more uh, longer period of time than uh, underpricing and that is really the start of behavioral finance so it was more about understanding markets from a practical perspective and after that when we tried to bring in the human element that okay we as humans do not uh, actually behave like expected utility maximizers there are always uh, factors which can impact our decision making so we are impacted by our own emotions our own surroundings what's happening around us and that can have an additional impact on how we transact so uh, it, it was like a back and forth process where uh, what the practitioners were telling was uh, actually predated what the academics uh, finally agreed upon by almost 20 years got it 
but so this this brings the discussion to this point of uh, wisdoms of wisdom of crowds versus madness of crowds and this is something that uh, you talked about in your first lecture as well and this is something that uh, anishtar has also written in his blog about why that collectively market as a whole is always efficient and people already anticipate things uh, be it the episode of uh, the challenger case when uh, the challenger goyes misfired and the people were able to anticipate in advance that this was the company who produced the faulty parts and recently even when we take a look at uh, the candidates for vaccine manufacturers against covid-19 the market was had already anticipated that companies like moderna and pfizer would emerge victorious out of all the possible candidates but at the same time as you mentioned there are instances like gamestop there are instances in the market as a whole where in research has shown that investors generally tend to invest at market peaks and leave the industry when the market has hit the rough bottom especially when we look at mutual fund data so how do you see the balancing of these two ways wherein at one point we are saying that the crowd as a whole is uh, pragmatic they are wisdomous and they know the market well and at the other end we see them making and repeating the same mistakes again and again uh if anish sir you can take this up yeah so you know taking up from there uh, abhi to talking about efficient market hypothesis so i think that uh, you know there is this uh, other uh, paradox the uh, grossman stiglitz paradox uh, paradox which talks about that uh, both efficiency and inefficiency in markets have to exist because uh, and farmer talks about it is in his uh, in his class that uh, you know that he likens the market to a, to a fish tank full of piranhas and somebody is feeding those uh, piranhas and within minutes the piranha the piranhas eat up the uh, food that is fed to them so similarly similar to that you know a market have to be kept efficient by active investors you and for active investors to be interested to them uh, for them it's some amount of premium has to exist for them to sort of uh, you know uh, to be in this profession otherwise everybody would be investing in a passive fund and then you know there would be uh, who would price it efficiently so th- so that that's something that uh, you know uh, that pharma himself has accepted that okay that it cannot be that the market is completely efficient at all at all points in time but it is uh, efficient at most points in time and that is where the wisdom of crowds also comes in that uh, you know this book uh, by jm sorosky by you know where the book uh, the term wisdom of crowds was coined so he talks about a few conditions under which the wisdom of crowds uh, uh, argument holds and uh, one of them is that the that you know everybody in the market or there is a certain degree of heterogeneity of uh, opinion now everybody then it become more like a herd and you know then that could gives rise to something like a game stock or can, that kind of a scenario where you know everybody is suddenly on the same side and then that herd mentality takes over and uh, but then it gradually again comes back on the other side so so you know coming back to that that you know there have to be active investors and uh, we never say that uh, you know that there will be no one who will be able to beat the market but it's just that we are not going to be able to pick that investor in advance that who is going to be that person who is going to beat the market which is where the problem of you know which mutual fund are you going to pick because you don't some mutual fund will will beat the market that is a given we just don't know which one it is so you know that's where that whole uh, the market price on that that okay you know on historic based on historical returns and then you're trying to price that and then by the time um the uh, people sort of start investing in that mutual fund uh, you know we may say whatever we we say that but uh, people invest based on past returns and by the, by the time you know people get on to that uh, a fund manager builds his brand the distribution network is made and, and the fund becomes too large uh, by that time alpha is gone and then we are a or you know gone to the next fund manager so so that's the cycle of uh you know funds and markets and and uh, crowd got it got it uh so uh my next question is around factor investing since we have already touched upon that subject so starting off with a very fundamental question as to 
why is it that factor investing works so what is the basic premise uh, behind identifying factors and using them to generate alpha over market return is it purely a form of contrarian investing in like to substantiate it with an example just because there is a model called capital asset pricing model and everyone is using beta as a measure of systematic risk to drive their returns investing against the beta or betting against the beta and investing in low beta stocks is a form of contrarian investing or is it just a data anomaly is it something that data has shown to work in the past and that is why investors are betting against beta what is the underlying premise uh, when we try to identify factors and invest in them professor bansal if you want to take that up. yeah so as far as the beta or betting against beta is concerned so essentially the the idea of capm was more of coming from the first principles of economics that if you really want some compensation it has to be the kind of compensation that cannot be diversified away and that is where the idea of systematic risk comes in but essentially fisher black in 1972 itself found that the actual security market line or so called the capm line is flatter compared to what the theory predicts so in at that point of itself people knew that capm is not a perfect model but it's a model which was easily uh, sellable from a theoretical perspective because it's very intuitive now the idea of betting against beta where where uh, what or what it simply means is that on a risk adjusted basis the high beta stocks which we expect to earn on an average higher returns they do earn higher raw returns but on a risk adjusted basis they earn lower returns than the low beta stocks so or if i have to put it in a slightly more technical terms if i compute the alphas of the stocks based on capm essentially the intercept of the regression the high beta stocks have typically negative intercepts and the low beta stocks have higher or positive intercepts so from a risk adjusted point of view people are better off investing in low beta securities but again this this was a empirical observation now the idea is to pin it to whether it's due to frictions ex existing in the market or is it because of behavioral aspects now this is where you know if you actually look at the data in a more granular manner you find both the factors existing at the same point of time so people who actually found this betting against beta anomaly wanted to see is this because of the leverage constraint so essentially the idea of leverage is that you can put 10 rupees in the market and take a position worth 100 rupees so if it so happens that your leverage constraint or rather you cannot take high degree of bet then to compensate for or to get higher returns you would bet on riskier securities so you are more likely to buy high beta stocks when you don't have lot of leverage available and that is precisely at that point of time the betting against beta gives you more returns because the high beta stocks get overpriced when there are practical leverage constraints the behavioral aspect of it is that is this anomaly more uh, or rather more intense when people are more speculative in their trading behavior and that is where the idea of sentiment comes in so what researchers found is that betting against beta gives high returns precisely in the high sentiment phase in the low sentiment phase of the market the pricing of risk return trade off is very very close to the theoretical counterpart so even a so called betting against beta anomaly which is so well uh, or so widely documented we still have not been able to disentangle the risk based or the friction based explanation from the behavioral aspect so so i think from a practical point of view we should recognize that both these risk and the behavioral components can coexist at the same point of time and rather than trying to spend too much energy in trying to disentangle which is uh, working at what point of time i think trying to understand the pattern and making wise decisions is more important and that is where the practitioners will have uh, more to contribute Yeah. Anisha, right. uh, you want to add something to that? Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, I think, uh, I think uh, covered most of it. So typically, there are two sources of you know, uh, or two primary reasons why uh, factors work uh, or are said to work. One is a, a risk premium, like he rightly said, and one is a behavioral aspect of uh, of uh, investing. now uh, do values now let, let's look at value for value as a factor now value as a factor to get that okay you are buying uh, cheap companies uh, which have uh, some underlying issue at some point in time 
and that issue is supposed to be temporary and uh, it will revert back to the you know, fair value it will sort of uh, say you know ir irrationally for some point in time uh, for low volatility he said as as uh, you said that that's also supposed to be one of the reasons for example you want to uh, you know there are leverage constraints now as a retail investor will you will you buy yes bank or will you be more excited to buy an hdfc bank you will be more excited to buy yes bank because you've seen it at 400 you're getting it at 10 rupees today and you have that anchoring bias as well as the lottery effect uh, thing in your mind that ye 10 ka 400 ho sakta hai you know but hdfc bank you know what will happen 1000 will go to you know 1050 1050 will go to 1100 so those small incremental good news is in, is ignored by these investors whereas uh, discontinuous good or bad news is uh, you know where media attention is high or something has happened uh, that you know they tend to pay more attention to that now to the most contentious uh, factor which is momentum which uh, pharma friends still don't put into their they've gone to a five factor model but they still don't add momentum to that and uh, so mo for momentum there is not a clear explanation aqr has done a lot of research uh, cliff asness wrote his paper under pharma on momentum and pharma said if it is he famously said if it's in the data write it uh, so you know he has that open mindedness to accept that yes, yes momentum is an anomaly that should not exist is is what he says but uh, you know like jim simon says you know if if the earth goes around the sun and we are able to prove that and uh, we can make money of it why should we be questioning why it goes around the sun why why is the sun going around the earth okay fine the, you know the, the earth is going around the sun let's let's accept that and let's make money of it so you know if the momentum effect exists and we are it is uh, statistically robust it uh, survives transaction costs it survives trading costs and you are able to get some alpha out of it you know do it why uh, you know why would why do you want to have an ex a precise explanation for every uh, thing you will not be able to explain uh, you know to everyone satisfaction uh, so like you for value you have the intuitive argument for low vol you have an intuitive argument uh, for quality we can have a have a intuitive argument for momentum it is very very hard to sort of and that's why uh, somewhere it's hard for people to accept uh, that kind of uh, that kind of a factor as human beings we like stories right so we 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 want to buy a stock with a story and if we don't know why uh, something is going up and all of that we are little uncomfortable buying that and again factors are you know uh, deal with a more portfolio construct rather than stock picking whereas uh, uh, we tend to glorify uh, stock pickers more that oh he identified titan he identified a bajaj finance or he identified an hdfc bank well before whereas with with factor we are we are saying that okay i don't know which one is going to do well however if i am going to construct a portfolio i am pretty sure that i will not miss the next bajaj finance or i will not miss the next uh, hdfc bank because i am pretty sure it, it will fall within one of these uh, styles of investing and i am going to uh, get it in, in one of those so so you have to leave your ego aside as an investor which is very very hard and say that i don't know but uh, i hope i am able to uh, get one of those and if you follow your process you is pretty sure uh, that you know you will you will uh, end up getting those multi bags got got it so now that you have mentioned about these factors different factors like low volatility quality value uh, especially uh, when we talk about it from an academic perspective usually people Uh, focus on one factor. So let's say if you are focusing on QMJ, which is quality minus junk, you are essentially trying to buy quality stocks irrespective of the price of the uh, that company. Or if you are focusing on value, which is high minus low, which is prioritizing high book to value book to price stocks instead of low book to price stocks, you are buying uh, high book to price stocks in, irrespective of the uh, quality of that stock. And then there are people who have identified crossovers between these two factors to invest. Something called quality at a reasonable price, or growth at a reasonable price, or even people talk about buy any stock at any price. Something called as Bob stock. So, how how do you navigate this uh, spectrum of crossover of factors, and does it dilute the impact of factor investing? Is it something that is actually new or innovative? How do you look at? 
Yeah, I mean, so academia suffers from a problem of phishing now because as Anish has written in his paper, like because of computing power available and wide access to data. Now, every, every researcher who wants to make his mark or his or her own mark essentially tries to identify one factor. And essentially now we have something which uh, I think Harvey calls a zoo of factors. So most of the factors are absolutely crap. But the factors which have survived have survived and are statistically robust, not just in US market or Indian market, but they are statistically significant across all major developed financial markets. Some of them include value, momentum, betting against beta, quality minus junk. And you, you pointed correctly that, you know, there may be some overlap in all these factors. So in last few years, there was a, uh, uh, an acceptance broadly in academic community was that the size factor no more yields result. And then Cliff Asness, if I'm not mistaken, came out with another paper. The title was Size Matters If You Control Your Junk. So essentially what he was hinting at was that the size factor still has explanatory role if you take account of quality minus junk factors. So in some sense that there may be overlap, but there may also be explanatory power of one factor if you are able to tease out the explanatory power of another factor. So this it's it's a very difficult question that you have posed to me as to what is happening right now. And my guess would be as good as yours or anyone else's in this in this matter. Got it. Anisha, would you like to add? Yeah. In fact, I was yeah, in fact, I was looking at the latest. Uh, factor dashboard today for uh, SNP. They come out with these factors and and the, you know these uh, overlap of factors. So uh, you know value has not done well for a very very long time. Uh, the and but in the last one year value has picked up uh, and and to the overlap the, in the last two months uh, has been almost fifty percent with other factors because. Uh, all kinds of cyclical companies, all, all kind of reopening themes, all that kind of, you know, we were uh, optimized for just-in-time supply chain kind of thing. And now we're facing a supply constraint because of all these kind of things. And those are all mainly value companies, which would fall under the value bucket. And uh, and the, the thing I, you know, I, I, I it, trying to choose the factor among all these uh, is like trying to choose a favorite child, but I have momentum as a, as a favorite factor is uh, uh, with with uh, risk adjusted momentum i would say with you know by taking into account the wall or sharp kind of thing as to rank it is because momentum is a chameleon you know it if if value is doing well so there is factor momentum and there is momentum factor so there you know the fa the momentum factor also has the element of factor momentum if value is doing well it will slowly shift towards uh, value if if growth is doing well, it will slowly shift towards growth. If quality is doing well, it will slowly shift towards quality. So it sort of tends to cover, uh, you know, because whichever style is in, um, and of course, you know, you cannot do run a very, very large book with that because uh, once you start rebalancing and you start facing slippages and, and those kind of things uh, come into account. But, uh, you know, if you're, if you're uh, doing a reasonable job at your, uh, I mean, the more frequent the rebalance, the better you can capture the changing uh, style. But uh, even if you have a monthly rebalance, even if you have like a bi-monthly rebalance, even with a you know with a six-monthly rebalance, the the Nifty 200 momentum 30 uh, index beats a lot of other uh, stocks. And if you see the rebalances, the factor, the industry exposures change fairly rapidly. Like you know when COVID happened it very quickly went into pharma and uh, FMCG. As soon as the vaccine uh, came, by Jan or Feb, they had a rebalance and they were quickly into a lot of the other, uh, you know, opening up themes like financials and cyclicals and things like that. So, so that's why I think, you know, more, uh, for a practitioner like me, I, uh, it is the one is the most hardest factor to explain to people because uh, people will buy quality. Okay, you can explain to them, you know, why you're buying... Uh, HUL or good ROE and uh, why you're buying a relax or why are you buying something else. But uh, if you say that, okay, you're buying something, you don't know why you're buying it. That's not a good story to tell to investors. But uh, when they see the return, then they're, they're okay with that. So, you know, uh, but yeah, multi-factor, I think it's, it's uh, factors do have their cycle. Uh, they do, uh, they do tend to have cycles. I think David Blitz has written uh, a paper recently called the quant cycle. 
so depending on with depending on business cycles depending on economic cycles depending on market cycles some factors tend to go in and out of favor but i think uh, uh, if you take momentum uh, if you if you were to just say okay you know you have to pick one i would say just say momentum because it sort of takes care of the uh, all the other factors good good and uh, a question to professor bansal so uh, when we talk about factors what i have observed is that uh, even when you're talking about the same factor a lot of papers and a lot of researchers use different measures to track that factor especially when it comes to factors like momentum or low volatility or quality like it's it's it gives you some scope of subjectivity to define what kind of time period you are looking at or what kind of standard deviation or risk measure you are looking at so is is there scope for generating alpha or differentiation just by the means of using a different formula or a different metric uh, to track that same factor i mean on on paper you can generate any alpha that you want but practically uh, is is it really possible that's a different question because see uh, when a paper is being written it's being written from a very very different perspective because essentially as an academic you need to get your articles uh, accepted in a peer reviewed journal so whatever is within the boundaries of what is a peer review process uh, researchers would try to do that but of course now the journals and the reviewers are aware of these kinds of uh, i would say cheap tricks and every uh, good or reputed peer review journal would ask for some kind of robustness checks so if you want to define value you may have to define it using price to fundamental ratios that fundamental ratio could be book value it could be eps so in, in that sense you cannot get away with just showing one factor using one construction and also to get your article accepted in a decent journal okay you may also have to do an out of sample test what it simply means is that okay you establish this phenomena in let's say us market now can you show me that this phenomena exists in let's say india or does it exist in a uh, in a sample which is uh, outside the sample period of your baseline sample so if you are doing this analysis for us let's say from 2002 to 2012 can you show this factor uh, exists in let's say india from 2012 to 2021 so those are the uh, i would say uh, checks which any uh, serious journal would ask the researchers to demonstrate before letting the article uh, be published because you can theoretically get alphas on paper by minor tweaks so and also an, another way to uh, get the results you want is choosing either equal weighted or uh, value weighted scheme so if you use an equal weighting scheme probably the alpha that you have on paper will be far greater than a value weighted weighting scheme but is it practical to always implement an equal weighted strategy that is something i don't know value weighted strategy may be far more easy to implement because then it gives higher weight to stocks which are more liquid which are more easily tradable which are uh, easily available and which are also uh, containing lower risk of uh, suddenly the liquidity operating the market when things turn south so that way a pure academic study versus how much can it be translated into real practice uh th- there is some difference in that yeah got it uh, so the next question to uh, anish sir so since we have talked about that factor investing is more an art of portfolio construction rather than picking stocks and especially when you are using a formula or some financial metric to create a portfolio there could be a chance that it is not very well diversified be it across size of companies or sector of companies or liquidity constraints or things like that so how do you incorporate that diversification element uh, into factor investing there are various uh, you know ways to do that uh, one one is to mainly you know uh, have maybe a, a percentage uh, weight on a that you pick so you could have a, a cap a 5% cap or a 10% cap if you depending on the size of your portfolio or uh, you could have a sector cap but typically if you you know when you start doing those kind of things then you do, you're not letting the factor do its job so i typically the the simpler you keep it the 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 harder it is to sort of uh, you know implement it sometimes because it can have uh, you know for example in the last 3 uh, to 6 months you would be having very very high exposure to say commodity linked stocks So then your factor goes, uh, then your portfolio goes uh, overweight on a lot of those kind of things, and there there can be practical difficulties because of that, because you try to get in and out of okay, these kind of companies. Then like uh, go down the curve, 
in terms of uh, smaller market cap it's, it's harder to implement that in india for you know to sometimes sell a stock even if you have to sell 1000 uh, shares or 2000 shares it sometimes takes the whole day for the deal sort of exit that, that without causing too much slippage causing too much uh, uh but at the same time if you stay within the top 200 uh, you know the 200 uh, names which are fairly liquid or can be uh, implemented using uh, uh, features and options and those kind of things where the the you know the market is fairly liquid uh, even there there is there is uh, alpha that can be created uh, if you don't keep these kind of constraints so it's better to do it in a uh, you know in a more of a AI for a hedge fund kind of structure where you can you have more of that where the, where the client understands what you're doing gives you a little bit more leeway to uh, to do that and uh, and yeah so the I mean the industry suffers uh, like I mean you said you're a little bit from as 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 academia even in practice you know uh, as practitioners people will try and you've never seen a bad back right because nobody will put a bad bad back test on to a PPT. they'll always always show you a good back test like an academic will always show you a good p value and a good p stat you know that um, so that p hacking that goes on in academia the that same thing goes on in uh, in practitioners that you know you have a nice i saw as uh, recently i saw i'll not name the the company i saw a uh, presentation of a newly launched hedge fund uh, which claims to be factor investing with a 32% cagr and 18% drawdown i said just take my money man I, i'll just retire and go home so 32% return with tail hedging with uh, all of that uh, you know and uh, no cost of hedging and uh, and a 18% drawdown now i'll just give all my money and go home i mean there are very few people who when you try and implement that something of that sort you are because those have been co-fitted to recent events so they would have worked perfectly well in a covid situation they work perfectly well but cycles change you know it's post post 2008 and 10 we've seen that uh, cycles have become very very short like if you see brexit we took 10 days 5 uh, or 10 days to recover from brexit demonetization we took ten, maybe a month to recover from demonetization gst uh, something like uh, the 2019 election then covid we took like two months Two months, you're back to back to the races, back to new all-time highs, and you're at eighteen uh, thousand. So cycles sort of become very short. Things keep on changing. The market keeps changing its underlying structure, and uh, if you try and sort of co-fit these kind of things, and uh, you know, like a decade is not a very is is a not a long time in academia. In in practice, you know, you'll be fired in three years if you maximum a client uh, investor will give you like two or three years. beyond that uh, even warren buffett will start getting doubts i think he's a statistical anomaly so <laughs> he's not you know he he lost his touch and uh, you know that poor guy if warren buffett gets that you can imagine what what you know mortal investors have to go through so cliff asner says that for every year the strategy doesn't work he ages by 3 years so so you know that's what you go in go through in the uh, in in uh, like you can very well have a lost decade right s&p 500 had a lost decade from 2000 2010 and suddenly from 2010 to onward just been uh, on steroids so as the nasdaq but 10 years is a very very long time i mean you know it's like if you are investing uh, for 30 40 years that 25% of your investing uh, life uh, even as a whether as an investor as a full time investor it's, it's a long time Our decade is a long time, I mean, but it's not a very long time in market. So you know, so you have to be careful of sort of uh, curve fitting, but you have to sort of uh, you know there'll be constraints of selling it to the to a client or or explaining that to to clients. So while clients will say that oh I'm here for the long run five ten years all of that, in practice two to three years is what they give you. After that then they start getting tired or uh, you know they they want to shift to the next new thing that has come fanged and. Uh, ETF, Fang ETFs, and this and that, all that. But it's fine. I mean, I think it's a it's a good thing that uh, that post 2015, I think a lot of these factor funds and uh, US funds and all those kind of things. So the building blocks for a uh, asset allocation portfolio are now there in India. So you know you can implement a lot of different styles and strategies. I think that that that's been a good thing. I would.
Got it. Good. Uh, so now, like we are mentioned about uh, funds trying to show higher previous returns, which are not really you can't really extrapolate into the future because there's mean reversion. You can't consistently outperform the market. Then there's recency bias. Uh, even this is something we see in mutual funds that more money flows into mutual funds that show higher returns, but they're not able to replicate it over the next uh, few years. So given all this uh, interpretation problems, given all this uh, talks about mean reversion, what are your thoughts on uh, index investing or passive investing as to say, uh, if Professor Bansa can take the both uh, from an academic perspective as well as from a practical investment stand of standpoint? I mean, from an academic perspective, one piece of result that has remained unchanged over decades is that active funds on an average net of fee do not beat index fund, at least in US. It may not be true for India. US is far more developed market. So beat, uh, coming up with a strategy which consistently beats an index is more difficult than that. But I think for a retail trader, like, I mean, I will not classify Anisha as a retail trader, but for now you, uh, Prabal and me can be classified as retail traders. So for us to, I mean, prevent ourselves from our own uh, stupid actions, I think it's good that we park our money in an index fund. We may want to tilt towards actively managed uh, mutual fund, but again, uh, your guess and my guess at picking a fund manager who would be able to beat the market next year is, is as good as flipping a coin and calling heads or tails. So for a retail trader, it's a very good strategy. Good. I think we just hit the nail on the head by it's, a, it's basically a coin flip. So, you know, the first study I did in 2019 was on index funds. And so what we did was we took the mutual fund industry as a whole from 2000, because that's the year when the Nifty Bs was launched. And uh, so we, and what we did was, uh, you know, we took inflows and outflows and we did a time weighted rate of return. And we said, does the, does the industry as a whole beat? So, so, so the, you know, the normal, the active fund manager will say that, uh, oh, but you know, it's a theoretical index replicated in real life and things like that. So we did not have uh, many years of data. Now Nifty Bs, uh, which is the first index fund, uh, index ETF launched. Uh, before that, we had a UPI Nifty index fund. So, so we took that and, uh, you know, uh, the same, what, what Avijit mentioned, it's the same numbers work out in India that uh, 90 to 95% of large cap funds do not beat the index. That uh, SNP brings out the CIVA report every six months. And that is across uh, large caps. It is across uh, middle and small caps. Some, somebody will, but it's a coin flip. You know, who's going to beat it? And, uh, you know, the, the funny thing was that Bogle did the study in 1976 in the US uh, that uh, the, the amount by which the... Uh, the overall industry as a whole uh, underperforms the index is exactly the amount of fee that they charge because on average they are going to be the market right because you are, you are the market on average and we found that same same two percent difference between index fund and the mutual fund industry as a whole which is that two percent that they charge that but they were underperforming uh, the uh, index nifty bees by two percent so it's it's universal thing, and you know most people they show me Japan. You know when something you say does this strategy work in Japan? So so now, so Cliff Asmus does everything there. He says this strategy works in Japan also. So so like that I'll say that you know index indexing index investing works in India, but we uh, you know it will be very it's very hard to follow for investors in uh, if you tell them uh, be average, like Fidelity very famously the guy Ned Jones said that you know who wants to be average when when Bogle launched his uh, index fund because the US is all about out outperforming it's all about being the best it's all about being doing all of that but in but in the market by by being average you'll be 90 percent of professional fund managers and it's still very hard for people to to get that so so we add, tell people you know people sometimes tell me you are an active fund manager yourself and you do find all of these kind of stuff why are you telling people to invest in index funds I said it's because the right thing for them to do I, even my clients, I don't tell them that invest all your money with me. I say have a core fund in which put in your core fund, put, put it in an index fund and have satellites around it. Have uh, Because everybody wants that optionality to invest, to outperform. You, because as human beings, we want that optionality that you should have something which is going to do well or something which may, which can sort of. So we, we tell them that, okay, look, whatever is you know important to your life whatever is uh, you know your 
non negotiable goals put them in safe uh, safe instruments they have your emergency fund have all of that kind of stuff then in the middle is your uh, put your index fund and then take max risk in your uh, active strategies and uh, uh, those kind of things where you have the uh, at least you have the chance to outperform if it doesn't do as well it's fine it doesn't impact your life it doesn't impact your lifestyle in any way or doesn't impact all of that so uh, with your excess money take a chance on uh, active funds uh, diversify go into aif or p funds or vc funds or you know or fancy uh, all other strategies at uh, you know futures options and all of that but as as a uh, if if you are a software engineer if you are a lawyer or a doctor or uh, you know those kind of things it's it's not your just because you have a brokerage account does not mean that you know you become a full time investor unfortunately the barrier to entry uh, is very low you know i i cannot say that let me go and teach a class in iim calcutta on the weekend i'll be me free ho to mai class sikha ke aata hu i cannot say that you know uh, i'll i'll go and argue a court case in the supreme court this weekend because i'm free chalo mai jata hu or you know let me go and do brain surgery this weekend but stock market is treated like that let me are jinjan wala has bought buffett bought paytm how can he be wrong buffett bought 0.00001% of paytm and rakesh jinjan wala must have bought like 0.0001 of jayaprakash associates but he will not even know like you know some kid in his office must have bought but uh, everybody fancies themselves please maybe fund manager and uh, then you but you should not you know that, i mean have have a limit I, i tell people have your fund have limited to 5% 10% you want to invest in the market for kicks so you want to do it to stay uh, you know that in the next party are i bought this multi bagger because people will always tell you about the multi bagger they will never tell you about the multi bagger the stock that made you know went down 90% they will never tell you about that so this is a funny story and, and and it happens too much with smart people that you know you are ca so he called me saying that you know uh, yes bank stock was at around 150 that fallen from 400 to 150 or something 160 and uh, he said should i buy yes bank i said boss the trend i mean i look at trends also you know just so i said the trend is down i don't i don't need to classify it as a bear or bull as it's a down trend i would not buy i think please wait for things to stabilize and all of that he said okay okay he didn't like the answer because most people are looking for an answer they want to hear so he said okay okay fine and uh, but then he he went and bought the stock he went and put a large chunk of his money so must be five ten lakhs or something the stock went to 220 he called me he said see stock went to 220 you told me not to buy I said, yeah, boss, you are right. You, <laughs> you, you. Know. Then, then again, the stock reversed, and then it started falling, and then it falls. You know, it went to one forty, it went to one twenty, it went to fifty, it went to. And I said, then, then, then again, he met me somewhere, so, so he was. So obviously, he remembered the yes, yes bank thing. So he said, yeah, I made a mistake. I should have exited at you know two twenty. I said that not exiting at two twenty was not the mistake. Buying at one fifty was the mistake. because you know you, you had no business buying that stock you are not a full time investor you are not tracking it you are not just because you saw it at 400 and you you are getting it today at 150 rupees does not mean it's a bargain you know does not mean it's a value stock does not mean it's a temporary stock and and you are a ca and also so you think that you know everything about value sheets and you know everything about but the behavioral aspect or the psychology of market you know what morgan house will say that finance is not the study of is not the study of money it's the study of how people behave with money so uh, uh, you know that you know that, and most smart people make this mistake a, a person who does not know will will take advice he'll say okay i'll put money in index fund i'll put money here i'll put money there okay fine but there's people who have a view uh, people who watch uh, cnbc people who read uh, economic times then and uh, is the market is set up to fool you it's set up in such a way because what works in life yeah, you know you have to do the opposite thing in market uh, you have to really control yourself you have to control your emotions uh, it's you know actually momentum investing is a form of contrarian investing because nobody likes to buy at a 52 week high 
everybody wants to buy it buy a stock at a 52 week low and uh, and you know everybody wants to buy that uh, value value company but uh, what works is the momentum which is buying at you know maybe a stock that has done well already gone up to x and is probably has the best probability of doubling or tripling from there but people don't want to do that so i i would say that momentum actually is a form of confidence investing for most people uh, you know earlier i would look we would look for 52 week lows to buy that okay you know now i'll now i'll buy this stock in 52 week low but or we don't know that a stock like kingfisher which has fallen to 10 rupees can fall another 90% and go down to 1 rupee we think that okay 10 rupees to you know how lower can it fall it can fall 90% lower and can fall another 90% rupee so it's all about a lot about behavior as markets become more and more efficient it becomes more and more about behavior and i think the edge in the future is not just uh, you know not just information because you know all of you have seen, seen the seen the series scam you know uh, we were in the in those times where the each two days three days later so you had an informational edge as getting information before you now today you and rakesh jinwala and jin simon and every and warren buffett everybody gets the information within the same 5 minutes or the same same 50 seconds that you know you are going to get the information but now it depends on how you are going to behave after that so the edge is not just information the edge is, and you know there are a lot of analytical tools available uh, there it's become much much cheaper computing power has become cheaper so just because you can analyze something and come up with a strategy does not mean you are going to stick with it in the future so i i think really the edge of the future is behavioral and not just uh, analytical i mean it's a given that you, you need to have analytical which is why even if you see you know uh, uh, the study that we've uh, done that the standard deviation between the performances of mutual funds has also come down a lot which tells you about the efficiency of market that that all these large fund managers are are basically hugging the index and as they hug the index more there the standard deviation between their returns also comes down uh, so what keynes called used to call career risk you know because you're not going to you're not going to get fired for failing conventionally you may get fired for succeeding unconventionally uh, so as a mutual fund manager why why should you take that you know why would you do that so if you are getting your fee you're getting your 2% you underperform a little bit it's okay you launch five schemes you can market the scheme which is doing well then you can sort of recycle next year you can say okay you know i uh, so you always because that cycle again you know keeps on repeating people will buy based on past return so then buy the scheme which is done the best and then by that time the scheme becomes bloated and you now everybody is buying nasdaq funds and fang funds and etfs and uh, you know but the tech wave in the us is probably uh, you know over and we may be seeing a commodity kind of uh, play over the next uh, 10 years we don't know i mean value may make 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 a comeback and you may see the best 10 years of value given the whole geopolitical situation and uh, the way the us is behaving in trying trying you know they want to devalue the dollar to some extent and trying to get uh, more jobs more of the blue collar jobs on shore so you may see all these kind of uh, geopolitical things happening how it impacts markets how they so that so the tech uh, you know the tech boom may be over but so so you can be pretty sure that you know when you see all these kinds of those those sort of uh, funds be narrow narrow thematic funds being launched uh, especially with sector funds also especially with all of those kind of thing you can be pretty sure that you know you sort of signaling that some kind of uh, sort of uh, you know end point or topping out uh, process is in place mm-hmm. got it so i think to sum it up i think there's this one line i read in one of your blogs where it robert kirby says that you can make more money by being passively active than be than rather being actively passive so i think that's that's the crux of this argument uh so to uh, pick up from what you said about multi bagger investments and people not talking about their multi bagger investments i think i would like to talk about uh, probably the first investment that i made which obviously turned out to be a multi bagger investment and uh, so this was just when i uh, when i had opened my dmat account and apparently i invested in ilfs and uh, not ilfs i invested after the ilfs crisis uh, india bulls and dhfl both were trading at very close to their 52 week lows so i invested seeing that these are good companies nothing bad would happen and then they 
fell like by 40 50% around a month later and i kept holding on to that like probably hoping that it would come back again i even bought a few more stocks trying to indulge in dollar cost averaging as people say and at that time i was not aware of this position effect as uh, anish sir also mentioned so uh, avijit sir if you would like to talk about this effect how how prevalent it is what your research has shown and is there a way to get around this so firstly let me make one thing clear i am not the first person who has researched on disposition disposition effect was first documented in 1985 long before even i was born so but the idea as it has come up in several forms in this one hour discussion is that when people invest in stocks uh, and if the stock appreciates or increases in value after the subsequent to purchase people will sell it but when it comes to selling stocks which have declined in value subsequent to purchase people have a very very hard time selling it because essentially it goes to the psychology of mind that you know when you are selling something at a loss in in some form you are admitting that you made a poor decision and that is something we we have a very hard time because all of us think we are better than average and kind of accepting the fact that we we made a blooper is something we are not very good at that's why when people invest in mutual funds and the mutual fund underperforms people have a very very or people have no qualms in cutting their losses so there is a reverse disposition when it comes to mutual fund investments that is another reason why you know it is suggested for retail traders to park their money in a mutual fund because they would have uh, i would say no two thoughts in cutting off a loss and blaming the manager for the poor underperformance of the fund but when it comes to blaming themselves we 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 are not very good at it and essentially that's that's the idea of disposition yeah you know this book uh... uh this is a zebra in lion country by ral fragner so he said that if at all you know you want to buy mutual fund at least like some people don't want to buy mutual fund he said at least if i can give you the weak, the weakest argument for buying mutual fund you'll have somebody to blame for your mistake mm-hmm. so you know just buy a mutual fund and stick with it at least you can keep blaming the fund manager like i mean he's rightly said we are we are very hard uh, you know we are it it's very hard for us to because you know by unless you have not sold uh, it's still a mark to market loss you have not accounted for it and we have this mental accounting trick that we that goes on into our head that uh, you know you are like you said you hoped it would come back and you hope that it would uh, sort of come back then you know by the time it comes down 20% uh you think i can't take i you know, the it will come back you know it's, it's in doable territory then it falls another 20% Then he said, "Oh shit, I'm stuck." So the trader becomes an investor. Then, <laughs> then, then it falls another twenty percent. He said, "Then by that time, he said, even if I sell it now, you know, it becomes a small part of my portfolio. So I'm not going to sell it." Then you keep on holding, keep on holding, and it, it sort of dies down. So, so that you know, cu- cutting your losses fast enough is uh, for any investor. Whether you know, uh, you know, the best example again I can give is a Warren Buffett. He said, "I read IBM." annual report for 50 years he has studied ibm for 50 years he bought the stock he found he made a mistake in 2 years he was out of the stock the man has studied ibm for 50 years <laughs> you know he he is not afraid of he is if you look at the, there is a paper again you know on his average holding period of some stocks is about uh, you know most of his stocks is about 2 or 3 quarters this is even when he was big and and all of that so he is going to mistake up you know he cuts it off pretty fast if he is uh, if he is like airlines you know if covid came hit he got out he he said that you know he used to joke that you know i should i should have that uh, uh, like you could have a suicide helpline i should have uh, you know uh, aeroholic uh, so, uh, because he can't help investing in airlines and he said i made that mistake again and covid hit and within within uh, 20 days he was out of all airline stock and they bounced back a little bit after that but he was not afraid to cut it off so uh, most good investors also i i would say are not just uh, you know because profits don't have to be managed losses have to be managed whereas we sort of we take we sort of tend to book the profit we feel good we, uh, we feel, there's a warm feeling in the heart okay you know i made money today i uh, fuzzy you got a warm fuzzy feeling okay i can you know uh, i made a 50% return a 50% return but boss that same stock and then you say tell me the next time so 
boss is why knew it was the next time then why would i be holding that in today so why are you always looking for something different to buy you know what just i hold your winners let keep on adding to them and whatever is not doing well uh, that is the whole thing of the coffee can effect also right with robert kobe you mentioned that that's how he discovered uh, that you know he never sold his winners and uh, the losers started shrinking uh, so to, so even if you are not selling your losers i would say that at least don't sell your winners you know uh, don't make that mistake that at least that so that they become if they become a like if you if you had put an equivalent part in your bajaj finance or hdfc bank a lot of people have i know have held on to something like hdfc bank for a very and uh, you know today Uh, if somebody would ask me to bet on a, on you know, I'm, I'm, I don't do discretionary investing anymore, but you know, if if at all I would I would do something or other, maybe the insurance uh, sector today, or or you know anything in, uh, to do with gas or gas infrastructure. You know, that's done pretty well in the last. Uh, so we we made one or two uh, kind of investments like that. But uh, you know, other than and if those companies are doing well, uh, they uh, you know they will continue to do well because of their large uh, because they've executed well. they will get a large disproportionate share of the industry uh and they will continue to do well for 15 20 years and uh, you know it's now that somebody like warren buffett has gone out and sold wells fargo he's not attached to it the only only company he says that he you know he should have sold earlier and for sentimental reasons is coke coke has not done too well uh, you know after after the recession but if you look at the rest of his things he's cut his losses very very fast and you know i think that's where Uh, more more research or for nudging uh, of investors uh, should go towards that uh, you know if you uh, made a bad investment sort of get out get out of it fast book that loss it's the cost of doing business i think once some fund manager you realize that it's the cost of doing this that you will make mistakes uh, and you know the error rate in the investment industry is very very high it's, it's you know that's another problem that is mental problem Uh, behavioral problem like if you were to uh, you know again like cliff asness says if you were to tell tell somebody that okay my car is might work 51% of the time you know you would would you ever buy that car you would never not buy that car you want your car to work you know 99.9% of the time if your doctor says there's a 51% chance that you know you're going to live after this operation you would not go to that doctor right the the success rate or the error rate in industries or if a lawyer tells you that 50% chance of in your case or not in your case but if you go to a, a well reputed lawyer uh, you know he he it uh, it's very likely he's going to win your case for you because he's a success but tomorrow if warren buffett or any other investor buy the stock and you buy a stock it's an equal probability it will go up or down in the short run right so so the error rate in the industry are high and and what you have to do in 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 professions with high error rate is to correct your errors fast and and not double down on something of that sort and that's where we have a problem and, uh, and and investors also while they understand that they don't want to see their fund manager making mistakes or they don't want to see something of that sort so so it is like something like a mutual fund manager uh, or wrapper or something of that sort where you know it it sort of uh you know the, you don't you don't see much of the the top 10 invest i can't hear him yeah I think there is some internet issue. Uh, I think uh, no issue. I think let's we can start with the next question. I think he'll join back. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I think I I dropped off. Yeah, yeah, we didn't hear the last one minute of your uh, uh, talk. So can you repeat that? Uh, I don't know where I got cut off. Uh, uh, so, so basically, I think I was saying that you know, yeah. yeah, that like there's equal probability if one of the boys tomorrow of the stock going up or not, so the error rate is very low. 
yeah so the so the uh, you know the error rate in the industry is fairly high so uh, you basically need to correct your errors faster than you need to start picking the next multi bagger or you start to, so which is why for like i was saying that you know for most investors it's better to do it by a by a mutual fund or index fund route where you know the index itself is a is an investing uh, strategy it's a very blunt force investing strategy where you the set of rules are laid down it's actually a quant strategy where you know the rules are laid down in advance there is very little discretion uh it it sort of is a is a mechanism by which the winners are held on and the stock which is not doing well is sort of discarded after one or two quarters and it sort of is thrown out of the index and something else takes its place it's like it's like your indian team you know if you are performing you are in the indian team if you are not performing you are out of it so you are basically holding on to your winners it's a very tax efficient vehicle because you don't pay tax on the churn and uh, and you know you and you don't have to control uh, think there so mm -hmm. that's why you tell people that your core of your investment uh, basket or your core of the investment portfolio is better to you know if you put it in index funds better to put it in factor funds better to put it in things like there where the strategy is laid out and is not dependent so much on uh, you know human emotion the odds of doing it the odds of that strategy doing better or doing well in the long run are are much better than you doing it yourself investing in direct stock yeah you do it have maybe 5% 10% uh, in in high risk sort of investment but do it after your core needs are taken care of got it got it on i mean on that note that even that book by michael morrison luck and skill i think that's a very uh, very good book for for most uh, investors to read where it talks about uh, you know how to uh, that in 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 uh, you know in like if you and vishwanathan aran were to play chess it it's for sure that you know he's going to defeat you but the same thing like if you and a uh, famous investor were to buy stocks uh, it it the, you don't know the probability is 50 50 so what what do you do in a situation like this you need to have a process based approach like even if you heard uh, you know ms dhoni talk about something of this sort in sports uh, and you know the either even in sports the the thing is he uh, michael morrison talks about as the level of skill goes up in an industry the the role of luck becomes more and more because uh, you know everybody is at an equal level the, so you don't have a the edge of skill over somebody else so the, so luck is going to do much better on that day so if you have a process that works for you if you have something that that is doing well for you so he says i take the pitch out of the equation i take the take the batsman and the bowler performance out of the equation i need to have good fielders who are going to save me 20 or 30 runs on that day if i if i replicate that process over and over and over and over and over again that small edge that i have translates into wins and translates into a tournament win and translates into something else versus somebody like a sachin or a virat or somebody where he focused more on individual performance individual uh, Uh, you know, players and betting on them versus uh, somebody like Dhoni, who was very, very process oriented. Very, if you if you hear his uh, post match conversation, it's always about a process. So I think even in investing, uh, Atul Gawande's book, The Checklist, uh, is recommended by Monish Babra and even by Warren Buffett and all those people. So I think you move more as in more and more you move towards uh, these uh, quant based or factor based. or process based kind of uh, investment strategies i think they will uh, they are very boring to execute which is why most people cannot they are like uh, you know if i show people some of the strategies that we run and they say but you know this is so simple i can do it yourself i said yeah but you know even uh, you know how to lose weight but do you do it do you get up every morning and you know exercise you know that you know so so we do kind of diet for junk food and things like that but are you able to do it so luckily in the case of investing you know somebody else can do it for you but you still have to hand over take the step of handing over your money to somebody like that but you still have to exercise yourself you still have to have a good diet so it again all comes back to you know uh, you know behavioral the behavioral aspect of uh, of investing you know here i have a question for abhijit you know you've been at Probably you've been asking the question. So, so Abhi, how do you see academia now? Uh, do you see, or do you see this uh, this uh, interaction between 
between uh, practitioners and academia are now increasing in finance uh, are you seeing that I, happen i mean uh, in asset pricing is one field of i would say academic finance in which practitioners have contributed significantly in the last 5 7 10 years but there are other areas of finance for example let's say in corporate finance or even if i talk about something like an ai ml i would still feel that you know engagement with industry is not up to the level which there should be because essentially a lot of techniques which uh, practitioners have already adopted years ago academics are now discovering it so now you will see a lot of papers which are trying to use ai ml algorithms and trying to form a portfolio yeah. rather than worrying too much about factors they say okay let me treat this whole neural network as a black box and whatever works for me i'll i'll use it to replicate and create returns let me not bother about giving a risk based or a, a behavioral based explanation for this or that factor so I, i think asset pricing is one field in which it has converged to a significant degree not so much in other areas of uh, finance and by that extension in other areas of, areas of management the the interaction is significantly lower so you know uh, uh, we've been talking me and my coach or we've been talking to uh, ima we've gone to isb about you know why why don't we have somebody do this uh, like we have the pharma french uh, factor database for in, uh, and i think ima uh, professors uh, uh, sobesh agarwal and uh, and uh, jr verma and jens verma and joshi jacob yeah 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 so so now i think the, again they've updated that database and again it's being used but uh, but yeah you know uh, that the problem also is with the practitioners and also with uh, india in that sense is that you know the the rate of uh, penetration of investment is so low that we are we are still such a very uh, real estate driven uh, and uh, heavy met, he, you know precious metal driven kind of investment driven kind of market uh, where the so, so like you know when i talk to uh, fellow fund managers they'll say oh it is mutual fund penetration is 2 3% it has to still go all the way but you know as i said you know i used to think uh, think about uh, telephony in the same way but we we leapfrog developed markets and we become the most uh, penetrated uh, mobile market in the world so there is there's no reason why you know uh, investment field cannot do the same okay fine you are you have 2 3% uh, mutual fund penetration but with uh, you know the millennials coming in and uh, and they are not so interested in buying gold or they are not so interested in buying uh, house right away or something of that sort they are more comfortable with with experiences they are more comfortable uh, i mean and now everything is available on an app things are available uh, easily so maybe you know penetration uh, goes goes much higher and the market becomes much deeper so then you know i think uh, people because then uh, investors then also try and look for an edge that okay you know how do i get an edge or how do i develop something that has uh, has a has a research edge so for example pharma is associated with this firm in the us called uh, uh, dimensional fund advisors dfs dfs yeah which uh, yeah which is, which is basically they sell factor fund i mean they uh, through uh, through ris so yeah so i i mean you you never know you know this thing could sort of uh, i mean the uh, the momentum factor fund has about a 1000 crore aum now and you know that's not small for something which is very very niche so i think slowly that kind of uh, and now with you know the, i think the nsc has done a fairly good job with all these factor indexes and uh, uh the strategy indices and smart beta and smart beta again is a marketing term for factor uh, <laughs> it's like it's like the other beta is dumb but you know you know like, what is a smart beta you would mean that the market beta is dumb but you know most of us yeah. are not able to beat market beta so so, so i like the term that goldman sachs has come up with they call it active active beta this is this is act, that factor investing is active beta yeah. So you know, so I said, okay, that's better than smart beta at least. Mm. <laughs> no, I I think you you hit the nail. Actually, the idea is that uh, see, when we talk about academics publishing a paper, they have very very different motive uh, behind it. They want to get it published in a peer reviewed journal. Now, what is interesting to a peer reviewed journal may not be so uh, interesting to a practitioner or a 
general investor in the market because typically an academic paper will be focused about doing a lit review identifying a gap and addressing a gap in such a way that the paper makes an incremental contribution now that incremental contribution can be so minuscule from a practitioner's perspective but for an academic to publish a paper which takes a time horizon of 3 yeah. to 4 years in any good journal so i think there is a disalignment of the incentives uh, and so if the academics uh try to do some practitioner oriented research not necessarily from the point of view of publishing in a journal then probably this kind of engagement can uh, be taken forward to a greater degree i think it's it's yeah. just misalignment of incentives <laughs> if i have to put it that way yeah and and you know even uh, maybe uh, come up with some uh, some uh, you know interesting tools or interesting ideas or implementable ideas that uh, that can be used by uh, by practitioners i think uh, so people think that oh, if it's been published in a in a paper then you know everybody knows about it and the edge is auto- automatically vanished and mm. so it's it's not like that it's not like you know suddenly it's not coke ka formula that you know if somebody knows about it then it's gone so mm. people think uh, that written the paper on it so now everybody knows i said Actually, I'm I'm not able to hear him. Yeah. Uh... Sorry. Yes, I... Anish. Yeah. 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 No, I was saying that. Uh, so people think that you know, if if the paper has been written, there is no alpha to be made or there. But people uh, underestimate the importance of execution. Uh, that you know, daily getting up, executing, uh, tuning out the noise. today putin has invaded today putin has invaded the fed is going to high rate the fed is uh, you know uh, us is going to go bust and that is so, so tuning out all that noise and executing your strategy uh, whether it is factor based or whatever your process is i think uh, that is very underrated in in that sense so i think uh, uh, because uh, people think that you need to know a lot about all of that and uh, while trying to uh, invest i mean you need to be aware of a lot of things but uh, i think uh, a lot of things are there in the price the price tells you a lot of things uh, there is more information to be had from prices than from uh, than from news or than <laughs> from other things that in fact i'd like to give you a very small anecdotal example of how much price can actually contain information so you know in 1950s early 1950s after world war 2 us was trying to develop the next version of the hydrogen bomb and it was a top secret and nobody knew as to what was the element which was being used by the us war department and one economist i think his name was uh, armen alshin he actually decided okay let me find it out in some other way so obviously there was some speculation as to which elements are being used so it was lithium thorium beryllium so what he did was very simple he looked at the stock price of the companies which actually mine these elements and with that he was able to figure out it's actually lithium and he wrote a paper and the next day he got a call from obviously a uh, top secret department in us government and he had to retract the paper so that is the extent to which you know the prices can contain information that you and i cannot i mean conceivably understand yeah. with the information that we have but prices may incorporated so if you know how to read them probably you can draw inference yeah. out of it yeah i mean that exactly the the example that prabal mentioned you know i wrote in that article about you know the, the, there were four vac seen four or five vaccine contenders and it was consistently that moderna and uh, pfizer were doing much better than the other contenders johnson and johnson and couple of others of them but uh, it was these these two companies that continue to do well and in some sense the market shifted out uh, a little bit ahead of uh, ahead of time so you know it was the uh, not too much fun for people that you know you know where is the next matlab how do i show that you know i i discovered like the ego comes into play the you know how do i show that i discovered moderna was going to do well because if you tell people uh, you know in that scared statistical point kind of way you know there is a 20% probability that moderna is going to but you, you can tell with that 20% probability i can make a lot of money if i make a slightly outsized bet on you know some of these things but yeah that's uh, that's investing so yeah. but uh, so i think this has been a very interesting discussion i just have one uh, final question to wrap up this discussion and this is more of a personal question and since both of you are here so like my question is more about uh, how do you learn about these from these things so 
especially let's say research papers so there have been countless research papers published in this field by uh, reputed professors reputed practitioners so what is your go to strategy of using these papers to learn from them because especially from the stand point from my point of view when i approach reading these papers they get very technical and for a lot of these papers you need to go back and google around a lot of stuff because you don't even have the basic understanding of how to do things a corollary to that is how do you learn from investors that i was reading your blogs anish and in that you mentioned that before entering this investing space you read like over 100 books on investing you learn from all these investors but whenever i am reading about them it always feels like yeah like whatever that guy is saying makes sense but how do i incorporate that into my investment style like what are some actionable insights i can gain so if you can just both uh, share your insights on that i mean that's a critique of academia in general right they write stuff which only they can understand and it is guarded behind a paywall so the knowledge so called knowledge which is being created it's not available freely to the public uh, so that's that's a discussion in, in its entirety altogether but i would say if you want to really learn about investing there are lot of non technical papers for example the cfa institute or let's say faj the financial analyst journal they they publish practitioner oriented paper which are necessarily not that technically laid out with jargons yeah. which are more easy to understand and which are actually geared towards people who want to get the crux of it and form an actionable strategy so i think it's it's a choice of the journal that you are trying to follow uh from the point of view of learning again i would like to reiterate that for a retail trader it's it's far better you stay invested through a passive fund okay be invested in the market over a long period of time that is more important than trying to pick stocks at your own end because then in that case not only do, do you not miss the bus but in fact you bear losses on 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 the journey so from the investing point of view i think passive strategy for a retail trader is is the best possible strategy on an average statistically you you are better off doing it yeah and you know it, it's not also like uh, again trying to put things in black and white but actually it's not passive because underlying the portfolio is changing so it's actually not not uh, so it's which is responsible yeah. for doing that this is active and this is passive and so you know to something of that sort so when like you said you know you're taking the passive decision to invest in that and the index remains that but as the as the stock performs you you are actually holding on to your winners you know hdfc bank reliance bajaj finance uh, you know the, the large uh, icici bank taxi bank all of those uh, the icps you've not missed any wealth creator in the last 10 20 years if you are mm-hmm. invested in an index fund it is the best thing you can do but it's uh, a boring way <laughs> that's yeah, the only thing it's not thing. fun ha matlab to 5% kyu keep for for sno weekly mm-hmm. expiry snos so yeah so coming back to your original question you know uh, again uh, i would say that there's a crowdsourcing way to do this so if you go to ssr and then search for in finance you know which is the most downloaded paper it's a paper by uh, beb faber uh, called quant uh, ta- tactical asset allocation uh, you know quant and you know what he does in that paper is basically uses a 10 month moving average to exit in and out of an index so if you want it's basically to do so let's say you know um, if you would ask ask me you know what's your biggest worry about investing in equity or for plan i said oh, you know what if some some market becomes like japan and i don't see high you know we are so used to seeing highs every 2 3 years 4 years market comes out and so you need to have some risk management uh, some kind of strategies where you say that okay you know some something has gone wrong it's not recovering fast so if you just use a 10 month or a 12 month moving average uh, kind of or a, or a dual momentum by gary and tonash something or that kind of strategy and instead of uh, you know equity you go into gold or something of that sort which ha- is doing better when you go into that that paper is perhaps the highest ranked paper on and the most understandable paper written in english uh, you know when i started reading academic papers 10 years ago i i also could not understand you know most of them uh, leave alone i thought i would write a paper someday i i thought if i just understand some of these papers there is uh but not the paper i have written is pretty well written i i thoroughly enjoyed reading it and to me actually i i couldn't actually believe that it's written by two people who are not professional academics so that way the literature review and everything done in that paper is actually hands down very very great no no my co i think my co-author has to take most of the credit for that he is a pro- he's a prolific writer 
and uh, rajan and uh, i and we we uh, we used to talk and you know we've never met we, he just stayed in singapore i am in bombay and we've never met and we just uh, started talking and then he said okay let's together and write this paper so that's, that's how that happened but uh, so thanks a lot of you for that but i think no, i hope you, you lot of the publish it somewhere that. so that the critique that trouble raised that kind of dampens to a little degree <laughs> yeah yeah so you've done put it on ssrn and uh, then i think a couple of other uh, uh, i think journals we i think we are going to try and apply to but uh, the idea was to just you know get people thinking about factor investing that it works in india that it uh, sort of is uh, you know is prevalent in india so because people would say that okay you know okay this works like this works does will it work in india same same critique was for index investing will index investing work in india because you know there is uh, you know india there's a lot of alpha you know fund managers can discover stories that are uh, undiscovered all of that but as as data has shown that uh, index investing works as well in india as it works in other parts of the world so Uh, so yeah trouble i think uh, just to get on to that and and i would say that you know like investing cannot be taught it has to be learned so do it practically uh, sort of invest keep a journal uh, you know write down your decisions why because uh, we like you know uh, again we tend to fool ourselves we we forget we make up stories in our head about why we invested and we make up stories about how we so you can write down about okay why am i investing what is my thesis and what is that point at which i am going to say that okay my thesis has gone wrong and i need to take corrective action so if you sort of you know do that your own style will emerge over a period of time like i like i said you know i did not choose quant investing it sort of developed over a period of time and uh, things happened makes sense uh thanks a lot anish and abhijit for taking out time i think this has been a great discussion Uh, this was a new concept i was trying out uh, bringing a practitioner and yeah. a professor together i think uh, it was i got to learn a lot and i think the listeners will benefit as well i hope you enjoyed uh, talking really to each other really. And, no uh, yeah. no really good talking to abhijit and both you and i think you did a great job of putting that those graphics together and uh, you know that yeah, uh, yeah for the paper you took out the learning then you and you just put those out i think uh, I think the marketing people could learn a bit from because it's it hard for people to understand jargon. Yeah, 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 and, you know, sometimes. Yeah. So I I was doing that for myself. So like like by reading yeah. your papers, I was constantly going back trying to understand things. And like I so yeah. Professor Pansal teaches a course for the first time. He offered this course, behavioral finance, uh, and that created yeah. a lot of concepts. And using that in your paper, I kind of prepared that PPT to help myself. And then I thought like I'll put it out and probably. a lot of people actually message me that that ppt help them to understand things and they could actually read your paper after that so uh, that yeah so i i think it was it was, uh, it was very well explained very lucidly explained and uh, i think you got the crux of so of what we are doing so uh, thanks a lot thanks again everybody and we'll see you in the next episode